Nathan uh, Hare will be the president, the vice president this year, and will be president next year. And she is in charge of all the programming this season. Uh, so I, she's, she's had a lot of good ideas, and um, this workforce panel was, was all hers. So I'm going to years, 
I see less people looking for those leadership positions and more people focusing on less leadership positions but having more of that work-life balance that they mentioned earlier. Uh, of course, wage increases, you know, over the last few years uh, and the fact that there's a lot of job availability now, that we have a lot of movement and mobility as far as within the profession. And I would like to add that uh, I feel really old because two of the panelists on here uh, had the privilege of being their principal. <laughs> so uh, I'm very proud of them and uh, glad to, to share the panel with them. So a lot of people talked about the remote or hybrid schedule, um, which leads us into our next question. Um, how has that affected or has it affected your hiring approach? Does it change the type of candidates you're looking at or considering for these positions? In the school system, we don't have a remote or hybrid position, so I really don't have much information to add on this. I feel like the other panelists probably do. With us, we are a consignment shop, so we're retail, and other than you know social media or that type of thing, we really don't have remote positions available. And to be quite honest, the social media of it all, my mom and I, we own the shop together, we do most of that on our own so um, kind of in the same boat we don't really have a remote position but like I mentioned it is hard when, when hiring someone because these days people kind of expect that remote um, availability so the remote and hybrid schedule is something that we do accommodate and we are able to accommodate so with what we do being um, we're uh, coast to coast truly so we have over 240 employees Across the U.S., we have about 50 that are on site in Central City. The people who we have on site, um, we do allow a lot of them, the admin staff, to work remotely or to work hybrid, especially if they have to travel for work. That's kind of been a testament to working remotely or working hybrid can be done as long as they have their laptop and if they're able to still do the job when they travel. Um, it has been kind of an adjustment for some managers or some management. Some people are um, have more of a micromanaging style, so it's been a little bit of an adjustment to get that manager to trust that their employees' work's getting done. So we do have some boundaries in place to make sure that work is being met, deadlines are being met, um, but as long as everything's getting done, we kind of let them do what they need to do, especially if it's something super important in their personal life or if they have to travel. So you would ask about hiring practices. Since COVID, yes, that has impacted our hiring practices. In our Workforce Solutions Division, we have uh, several positions that are creative design, instructional design type of positions. And prior to COVID, we would have hired a full-time person. They would have been expected to come in, punch the clock, that time. And after COVID, though, we've learned, you know, we really can maximize our resource by, resources by looking at um, hiring people for their particular skills. Not to come in and do necessarily a full-time job, but if they're good at designing courses or uh, coming in and, and creating training programs, writing curriculum, whatever, we'll just piecemeal and hire for those specific things. So yeah, it has changed the way that we hire. Um, Tristan, oh sorry, had mentioned, you know, kind of having issues filling leadership roles. So kind of on that, on that thought, um, when it comes to training and looking for specific roles such as that, um, is there an area you find that's consistently deficient in new employees? I would say, you know, I, I'm going to look at it from the perspective as far as hiring teachers. Uh, because with the shortage of teachers that we have right now uh, across the state, there's a lot of alternate certification <laughs> programs that the school district utilizes to get people certified. And so with those certifications, uh, whereas where people would have went through a traditional program and came out and done their student teaching and go into the classroom, now we have people who have graduated and they have a degree but not in education. And so they're getting, they're getting their teaching certification as they are teaching in the classroom. So it's a, a shift in the mindset of where there is less of that pre-training that employees have when they come into the profession and there's more of the duty of the school system of providing that support and in training those employees as they are in that classroom. And, you know, uh, as far as looking at, at those leadership 
positions, I just look at it from the lens of, you know, applicants that we have for some of those positions. The, the numbers uh, of applicants that we have have dropped off uh, quite a bit over the past, I would say, 10 years. And I think uh, part of that is, is kind of a cultural shift and going back to that work-life balance and, and wanting to do their job and not necessarily taking on more stress of administrative positions. Touching on kind of what I mentioned before, um, we are noticing people not necessarily, I guess more so people just wanted to work on their own terms, and that doesn't necessarily just apply to scheduling, um, but we have people that, it's hard to find people who, I'm trying to think about how to word this and not be rude. <laughs> people don't want to take advice or listen to the ownership. Um, and that's been a real struggle for us. Um, especially, you know, we, we're we a much smaller organization than like the school system or you all. Um, we have two employees. So we are... Um, it's very important that people, that our employees listen to us and, um, you know, abide by our rules and boundaries. But at the same time, most of the time, these girls, we have two girls, the girls that are there, they're working alone all day, every day. So it can feel like it's they're, that they're running their own store. Um, so there's definitely a balance there. Um, and just to take it, like, very simply, a struggle that we have is phone usage. <laughs> um, a lot of... Our, we have younger girls, and um, we have had people, we've had a singular person in an interview um, just flat out tell me before that they are addicted to their phone and that it would be a problem if they can't use their phone during work. And um, you can imagine they did not get called back. But it, that is, it's something that we're having to deal with. You know, growing up, I, I don't remember a time whenever I was younger that being on your phone was appropriate ever at work and now being on your phone it can be part of your um you have working and and there's really great things that happen on your phone while you're working but there are also really not great things that can happen when you're on your phones yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and, and piggyback off uh I want to say as well, you know, one issue, one thing that I've seen is attendance issues as well, as far as people showing up to work, uh, showing up to work consistently, and, uh, you know, even the customary two weeks notice before you leave your job, that you see less and less of that now. Uh, so I am a 2022 graduate from WKU, and one of the main things that our teachers uh, or my professors instilled in me was that there will be a huge generational gap in the workforce. So with the boomers uh, being, they're them retiring and that kind of part of the workforce um, leaving the workforce, that there will be a whole new set of problems that we've never really faced or dealt with coming into um, the new age. I am a Gen Z, so I can attest to there are a lot of problems. My employers typically say that I'm kind of rare in the sense that I'm not addicted to my phone or that there are boundaries and standards at work. Uh, so one of the things that we've really tried to work with is um, trying to bridge the gap between generations and try to let people understand. Um, sometimes you have to break it down as simple as you can. If you don't tell them, then you can't get mad that you that they might not be meeting your expectations. So a lot of leadership um, trainings and issues that we're having is people say, well, I just want them to be just like me. They're not, they're not doing it to my standards. They're not, why can't they just do it the way that I do it? So a lot of times in HR, um, being the HR generalist, I have to sit down with those managers and say, hey, well, did you tell them to do it? Did, did you set that expectation clearly? Um, have you had a conversation? Have you tried to sit down and have at least a verbal conversation? If they're just blatantly being disrespectful and it's become a blatant issue, then we can take further steps. But that is a really big issue that we are facing in leadership. Like you mentioned, people are addicted to their phones. But you go back to the hybrid and the remote um, work, what we've noticed is we do have a lot more productivity of the people who do work hybrid. 
So if they're able to take one day a week to get all their doctor's appointments knocked out in one day, or they're able to take their kids to their appointment, or they have things going on, we've noticed that they are more attentive at work, that they were able to have that day to, to do what they need to do, but they're still able to hop on their Teams calls or their Zoom calls, or do whatever it is that they had scheduled for that day. So that's kind of helped in that generational um, gap, if you will. But also we do hire a lot of younger employees as that's who's filling the workforce. So just really setting the, the standards and the boundaries up front as clear as you can so that way there's no room for confusion on any parts. And if you've met any of Ashton's employees, they are the most professional people I've ever encountered. So you're doing something right. Just one quick thing to add though about, we provide um, customized training for companies, whether it's manufacturing, healthcare, business, the number one thing that we've been doing the last year is leadership development. And it's just what you all have said. It's how, how do different generations communicate more effect, effectively? How do you lead different generations? And so that evidently is a need for everyone. Yes, I'm so glad you two touched on the generational differences because I do think that it's, you know, it's really affecting the way we are working every day. And it's something that a lot of people, I don't think, have really thought about how it plays out Our next question is, how do you think economic, social, or technological factors will impact hiring in the future? So where are we going? You know, we've had a lot of changes since 2020. We're going to keep having those changes. What do you think is going to happen? Definitely. A big, a big discussion we're having now at the college, just college wide, is artificial intelligence and um, how we use that. and promote that, allow the use of that as far as creativity. But I know, for example, my division, when we're charged with creating and developing, it is a key component of what we do. And so we had to embrace that technology and resource early. So I think there'll be things like that that continue to evolve that we have to be on top of to uh, ensure that we can do that and hire people who can do it. Oh, I love ChatGPT. For sure. Um, like what you touched on, Cherry, evolving is one of the biggest parts of it. Um, I don't think that anything will change. If anything, I think that the generational gap will just continue to get a little bit worse. Um, so just really staying on top of new trends, uh, staying on top of what's going on in your community and what's going on around you. Um, a struggle that I face is we have a lot of remote employees. So we have 240 employees across 23 states. So a lot of my interviews that I do are remote via Teams or Zoom. So really staying connected and letting them know that they're not on an island, that we are here for you. Whatever you need, I will do my best to accommodate to you. Um, I think making people feel that they are needed and trusted and respected goes a long way, or that's something that I've noticed in our practice. Um, letting them know that we trust you. I hope that you're getting your job done. I haven't noticed otherwise. But I think AI will be a really great tool, but also a bad tool. Um, we have some instances now where some Gen Zers, um, they were given a task at work and they used ChatGPT to fill in the spreadsheet and they, we needed it to meet certain parameters. ChatGPT did not meet those parameters, they sent it off and it was completely not what we needed or not what we wanted. Um, so learning that it might be great, it might be a super fast and easy tool to use, but be very thorough when you check it that it might not pull everything that you need it to um, or filter or it cannot just build your spreadsheet to certain parameters. Um, so just being very clear on boundaries with that, that <coughs> it might be a great tool but still run it by me or still uh, double check everything. That technology is great but only when it works. Yes, so this question kind of scares me because <laughs> we are a very small business in a very small town and we like to, I mean, be pretty traditional with our storefront. We like the, we like the customer interaction. We aren't ever going to go to um, self-checkout like you'd see at Walmart or something like that. Um, so, and that's, and, you know, if, even if we had the resources to do that, we wouldn't because we, we enjoy that aspect of our small consignment shop. Um, but in turn, whenever it comes to hiring somebody, you have a lot of people that are looking for remote positions, um, a higher salary, and as a small business, it's, it's scary um, to think about that. So, yeah, I don't really have a lot to say other than that because it's, that's a scary question for me. <laughs> 
So support small businesses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, we live in a time where we have access to an abundance of information and it's all at our fingertips and technology just continues to evolve. I think, uh, you know, as we move ahead, there's more and more of that focus on how an individual is able to utilize that technology uh, to accomplish their task to the, to the greater good. Uh, you know, one thing we could probably all say throughout our lives is that there's, we've never really went backwards toward technology, that it just keeps moving forward, and so we have to evolve and adapt. And, uh, you know, an example I would even pull from that is when we look at education. You know, uh, when I got my master's degree many, many years ago, I had to drive to Western Kentucky University for all of those courses. They were all in person, or maybe a, a weekend where you had to go in person. And now, you know, at our universities, there's so many online options that you can get any degree you want uh, without even having to step foot on the campus. And then once again, it's just that another example of that evolution of technology. And then after COVID, they just kind of kick-started and, and speared it more forward. And so I think we'll uh, continue to tackle those challenges as we move forward. Uh, there's so many things I want to touch touch on and ask follow up questions, but we're running out of time, so I'll keep going. Um, if you could, you know, pick the biggest challenge that you face when hiring, what would you say? The last couple of years, I would say, would be qualified, certified applicants, especially for certain positions that we have. Uh, you know, like for example, to be a high school teacher, you have to have an undergrad degree in the area that you're teaching. And so some of those areas are hard to find, uh, areas such as math, uh, chemistry, you know, your higher science courses, that there's not many people going into those professions or going into uh, that field right now. And so it becomes more and more of a challenge of finding those qualified, certified people to teach those courses and to provide that to our kids. So that would be one of the challenges. Um, you know, one of the, the hiring challenges I'd say that we have as well is just competing salary-wise, uh, which we make great gains in this, but you're always in competition with those districts around you that may have a higher tax base, they may have a higher salary scale, you know, uh, that's always a competing factor that you have too. But I feel like if you, you build a good culture uh, in your company or in your school, I feel like that that is perhaps the number one tool you can have to keep people uh, with you. You know, from my experience, I uh, started teaching. I wasn't originally from Ohio County. I started teaching here 20 some years ago. And uh, just because of the culture and the county, uh, that I grew to love it, and I, I've been here ever since throughout my career, and I would attribute all of it going back to the, the culture of the community. I definitely second the um, keeping up with pay, with wages. Um, that's something that's very difficult for a small business, especially. Um, something that is challenging for us in especially a small town like we're in, um, I don't know if the right word would be, and this is going to be very honest, I don't know if the right word would be like hiring bias. Um, in a small town like this, you know everybody, and you know everybody's family. So for us, it's hard because, you know, reputations follow you, and that's that's just how it goes in a small town of Kentucky. Um, so actually, we've been try, we strive to not hire somebody based off of who they are, who their family is. Um, in fact, we try to pick people that we don't know, that we know nothing about, because it gives us an opportunity to really be able to train those people up and not have to worry about their families or um, breaking trust or friendships with people that we do know. But that is something that we definitely struggle with in a small community. Uh, so some of the issues that we face or some of the struggles that we deal with is, so I'm based in Central City, Kentucky. Um, finding the employees that do not move away that need to have the skill sets that we need. 
So trying to retain local talent to get the, the HVAC techs, to get the electricians, to get people to go into the blue collar work. There's just not as many of them. The people that do it are very, very experienced. They're very good at what they do, but a lot of times they come with a really high price tag. Um, and while we, we like to be competitive with our salaries and we like to stay, can, we like to consider ourselves competitive in our wages, um, retaining the talent in the area. We also face a lot of, with our um, admin staff and some of our higher positions that might require higher, higher education um, or more admin and technical skills. Um, we don't have a lot of those in our area or the applicants that we're getting just are not, they're not local to us and they expect to be remote for um, another HR journalist. We just hired one out of Elmansboro, but a lot of the applicants were applicants from Tennessee or from Georgia. We had a lot of Alabama. Um, they expect the position to be remote, that they can just email the employees and talk to them and get what they need, help them with benefits, all of that. Um, but I think a big struggle that we're facing currently is the talent that's local. How do we keep them? How do we attract them? Um, we pride ourselves in our culture. We try to treat our employees how we want to be treated and to be very, very fair and maybe a little too fair sometimes. Um, that can be a problem as well. Uh, but I think really once we get the people on site and we're able to show them the culture and we're able to show them we care about you, we want you long term, this isn't something we want you here for six months and then we find someone else. We want to find the people who want to grow and want to build. Um, so I think that that's a really big, a really big struggle for us currently. Our biggest, excuse me, our biggest challenge um, at the college, college wide as well as in our division, is competition. Uh, for example, uh, the last two years, I've had to hire three different director of technical education because they would do such a good job that our industry partners would hire them away. And hire them away, I'm not exaggerating, at least double the amount that the college was able to pay. So we deal with that in healthcare and in uh, our industry programs. And it's private business, it's industry, so we understand that. And our industry partners tell us they have the same problem. Anytime they have a good position open up and they get someone, they're more than likely poaching you know, from someone down the street. So we know that's a universal issue. So we've talked about a lot of challenges that you all face, but I want to end on kind of a higher note. Um, so what do you think, when it comes to employee retention, what do you think you all are doing right? Well, I'm going to speak for some of the things that the college um, currently is doing with our employer partners. We have expanded our work and learn options for our employers, whether that be business or manufacturing. You've probably heard of the GoFame program. You've probably heard of the Go Careers program. We have apprenticeship programs. And the idea is that employers come together in order to build their workforce. They have a no poaching policy, so they can't take from each other, but it allows them to build either a pipeline of new employees or work with some existing employees they have to really skill them up to advance. So those we've seen those strategies work very well as we work with other employer partners. Uh, one of the things that I believe that we do correct um, is our culture is very, very, very positive. Um, this year we took on a really big client. All of our employees were working extremely hard. Um, so a lot of people are getting burnt out and our president of our company and this uh, general manager, they see that, they understand that, and they essentially develop an employee focus group. So we got a bunch of employees of different um, positions together to see what can we do better, what can we do to keep you guys. We, we love all of you, we understand that you're going through a lot, we understand that it's been super hard this month, what can we do? Um, it's one thing to conduct that, it's another thing to implement it, and our president, the CEO and the general manager, they did just that. They implemented new policies, they implemented hybrid work, they implemented um, more vacation days. We, we did what we could to keep our employees because we've invested so much into them and they've invested a lot of their time into us. I mean, when you think about it, you spend eight hours a day at your job. It's more than, you might get to see your kids or your family, uh, friends, so we really done what we can to make it a positive experience while they're at work. So they don't go home and they, you don't take out your frustrations on your kids. You don't take out your frustration on your spouse. Um, while that might be evident some weeks or sometimes that might just be bound to happen, but we've really tried to make it a culture where you can lean on uh, your fellow coworkers and you can lean on management to, to trust that you can tell them what's going on and, and come to a solution together. I would say something that our employees value in where we work is you know, we started, it was just me and my mom. We were a mother-daughter duo to start. And so 
whenever we hire somebody on, we truly try to keep that um, family feel. We try to treat our employees just how we would treat each other, and we respect what our employees have to offer to our, our business. I mean, we are fairly new at this too, so any ideas that they bring to the table, we try to implement them and um, just give them a try. And if they work, they work, and if they don't, then we've all learned a lesson. So I think that our girls really value that we value what they have to bring to the table. Um, I have another thing, if I can think about it as she was talking. Oh, I would say that we're very flexible, um, which can be a fault, too. Um, but I mean, our, our employees pretty much make their own schedule. They tell us, you know, if they need to be off a certain day, we try to grant them that because like you said, they're giving us so much of their time. And you know, our girls are young high school girls, college girls, whenever you work in a retail store in a small community, you're gonna get young high school girls working for you. Um, and so we try to honor that, you know, they, they wanna have date nights, they wanna do these things and, and they deserve that for as well as they work for us. So that's what I would say that we, we do right. Echo a lot of those same sentiments. You know, a few things that we've tried to do in the last few years. Uh, one is you know, the obvious the increase in wages that we've given around 11 percent of raises over the past few years. But you know, once again, like I spoke about earlier, I think culture is one of the most defining things uh, to keep people content where they're at. And part of that culture is giving people the tools and the resources that they need to be successful in what they do. And uh, I feel like we try really hard to, to give our staff the resources that they need and the support that they need so that they can be successful in what they're doing and feel, uh, feel like they have a place. Well, I think you all have touched on just so many important topics uh, when it comes to workforce challenges and hopefully some solutions. And I hope that our membership um, maybe is feeling some validation. You all are having some of these same struggles and some things to think about uh, going forward in your careers. So thank you again to our panelists. Uh, we greatly appreciate you giving us your time. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Chuck for some final announcements. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, panel. <clears throat> it's very informative and very appreciated uh, the whole group. Whole uh, <clears throat> So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, draw for the door prize, uh, which is, is First United Bank. We've got we've got two two chairs brought by First United, uh, and our ticket number is eight eight seven nine eight three.